So welcome again today to the TASC 90 webinar, the fourth one for this current program year from TASC. And today's topic is mid-level, um, focusing on leadership and mid-level managers within critical access hospitals and how we can best support them. So we hope that participating in the event today, you'll understand the importance of leadership that they provide to mid-level managers at small rural hospitals, that you'll gain awareness of new leadership resources to support those mid-level managers, that you'll understand the role mid-level managers play in value-based payment models, and that you'll learn how your FLEX program can help support leadership of critical access hospitals. So we have a variety of different updates to provide first in the webinar. So I'll provide one on behalf of TAF, then Tori Leach will be providing one um, from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy for the FLEX program. Um, her counterpart at the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, Carrie Conejo, will be providing a regulatory update. And then we have two more partner updates. Carla Wang from Stratus Health is joining us today to talk about an update on MBQIP and the Rural Quality Improvement Technical Assistance that's available to support that project. And then an update from Megan Lard, the University of Minnesota from the Flex Monitoring Team. And then we'll get into today's kind of content or the topic of the day. And at that point, I'll introduce our three speakers to you. So with that, I'd like to provide a, a brief update for you uh, from TASC. And it always seems at the end of the program year, we have a lot to share. So thank you to all of you participating in the reverse site visit last month. We appreciate all your feedback on the satisfaction assessment. And really we're pleased to share that the event demonstrated knowledge gain and that we had high satisfaction with a score of 4.5 and a five point scale for the overall event. So we're really happy with that. Um, we're working to get the recorded sessions onto the TASC website, but in the interim, you can continue to access all the event recordings on the event's attendee hub. Um, a special thank you as well to the eight EMS supplement states that participated in the virtual small group meeting that was also held at the end of July. We look forward to supporting you as you enter your third year of your project and, and wrap up your project next year and dive more into documenting outcomes and preparing uh, for sustainability of the pro projects after that third year. It was announced during the reverse site visit, but I wanted to un underscore it again that the Small Rural Hospital Blueprint for Performance, Excellence, and Value was released in July. That blueprint's intended to be a tool to assist rural hospital leaders in implementing a comprehensive systems approach to achieving organizational excellence. It contains an outline to the key interlinked components of the Baldrige framework, along with critical success factors that are relevant to small rural hospitals. And challenges and strategies are, of course, identified that, and, and documented throughout that blueprint. Importantly for the State Flex programs, though, is that there's a companion resources that focused on the related strategies and resources that your FLEX program could implement to support the identified strategies for the critical access hospital. So um, in the blueprint, the strategies and the challenges are identified. And then this companion document for the state FLEX program um, kind of crosswalks it together and suggests different activities that you can implement in your program to support the initiatives within the hospital. So please check those things out. The National Rural HIT Coalition continues to meet bi-monthly. If you're unfamiliar with the coalition, it's existed for <laughs> quite a long time now, and it's an informal network of rural um, and HIT leaders from organizations at every level that work together to advance the implementation of health information technology or HIT across rural America. The next call is on August 31st, and it will be focused on equity. If you're interested in participating in the coalition, we just need to know, so shoot us an email. You can email task at ruralcenter.org, and we'll get you added into that email listserv because everybody isn't automatically just put into that. And then you'll get those call notices and, and are free to join. And we, we'd really love your participation in that. This program year, we held a telehealth webinar series. And we've completed, so far, five of those six webinars. Um, the sixth one is coming up. Um, and these, this webinar series is all to provide education to the state flex programs to help you gain uh, information and awareness about telehealth and what it means for your critical access hospitals so you can support them with initiatives. So we've been collaborating with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, the Office for Advancement of Telehealth, as well as the Telehealth Regional uh, Telehealth Resource Centers. Um, the next webinar is on September 22nd, and it's the second of a two-part series about rural telebehavioral health. So there's a call notice that's already gone out to you, and you'll get reminders about that as well. And then we have quite a few guides that are coming up that will be released um, here late this summer and into early fall. So we've created or in the process of creating a critical access hospital telehealth guide. So really to help CAHs implement telehealth, there'll be a webinar to launch that guide on September 6th. So look for more information on that. 
Um, for quite a while now, um, we've created and are, have been maintaining with updates a COVID funding impact, uh, an update to this document called uh, COVID funding that's impacting rural providers. So at crosswalks, the different federal funding opportunities that exist to support COVID and COVID relief um, and by type of rural provider um, as kind of a quick kind of cheat sheet, if you will, or multiple cheat sheets about what's going on, what the funding is used for and, and things like that. So we've had many iterations of an update. We were just about to release an update and then some more federal information actually just came out last week about an important program. So we'll get that documented and updated and re-released to all of you shortly. There's another document called Navigating Rural EMS Change that is soon to be released as well from TASC and FRHP that can help your rural EMS agencies consider how they should be navigating this change in the transition to value, what their role is to play in that, and also how they can um, navigate the changes that are happening within volunteerism within our country and shifting to uh, more of a business-based model. And then lastly, the uh, a guide that we have in the works is one on critical access hospital key financial indicators in light of, the COVID, in light of COVID. Um, we know that the financial indicators are having large implications, not only in the data that's showing and how actual that data may be because of the influx uh, of money and the changes in business patterns, but also recognizing that there's a lot of challenges that are being presented to critical access hospitals to manage their finances right now, even more so than before. And so this document will highlight some of the implications of the key financial indicators, as well as some strategies that critical access hospitals could deploy to manage the, the changing and shifting kind of dramatic changes that we have going on within the finances. So that will come out probably closer to October. Lastly, TASC has been supporting um, the Quality Innovation Project um, and the QILs with Quality Innovation Labs with FHP, the Flex Monitoring Team and Arkita. We know that the QIL groupings were announced yesterday via email. We won't be addressing those today during the call or the webinar, but if you do have questions, please email task at ruralcenter.org and we will get your questions um, funneled to the right location. So with that, those are the updates that I have to share on behalf of TASC and I will turn things over to Tori at FRHP to provide the update from there. Thank you so much, Tracy. And I'll be doing my update alongside of Carrie, our policy coordinator, who has returned from a maternity leave. So we're excited to welcome her back in her role. Um, so we have some policy updates to share with you. I'm going to just share my screen here. Can uh, Tracy confirm that she can see my screen? Great. All right. So, oh, apologies. So the first thing that I want to mention is congratulations to everyone who received their notice of award for flex program year three. Uh, I know North Dakota is my only outstanding state that has not yet received a notice of award. If there are other states out there who have not received their NOA, please reach out to me immediately. Um, I will be hosting alongside of TASC an end of year two wrap up webinar on September 2nd at 1 p.m. Central Time. This will cover your year two end of year report requirements, which includes the PIMS Performance Improvement Measurement System report, the end of year report for both regular flex and EMS supplements, and the submission of your federal financial report. So please tune in and listen to the recording of that September 2nd webinar. Switching gears, I wanna chat a little bit about a new request for information that was released um, in the CMS Hospital Outpatient Prospective Payment System proposed rule for calendar year 2022. This is a uh, request for information on the new provider type, the Rural Emergency Hospital, which was enacted as a part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. This basically would allow a critical access hospital or a small rural hospital with less than 50 beds to convert to this new type of provider. Um, there is an open request for information that asks for specific comments to be made from rural stakeholders to the extent of which the existing health and safety standards should apply to this new provider type additional standards that may apply, what kind of quality reporting they should be required to do, payment policies, how to address health equity, just tons of things for you to comment on for this new provider type. And those are due on September 17th on regulations.gov. 
And I just want to point you to some resources that we have funded through the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. The University of North Carolina did a uh, issue brief estimating the number of hospitals that may convert to this new provider type. And our team at the Rural Health Value recently published a brief to help prepare stakeholders to comment on the CMS RFI. No SOAR partners with the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health will be holding a listening session tomorrow and flex coordinators are welcome to participate as a part of the State Offices of Rural Health. I'll now turn things over to Carrie to cover some other important reg updates. Thank you, Tori. So definitely a lot has been going on while I was out on my maternity leave and a number of rules uh, have, have been published by CMS. Um, first, I'm going to start with the fiscal year 2022 Medicare final rules. So the first is the inpatient perspective payment system that also includes the long term care hospital um, PPS uh, final rule. The first thing I note is that um, the rule will be issued this year in multiple parts. So provisions related to disproportionate share hospital payments, organ acquisition costs, and the provision of uh, the consolidated provisions associated with the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2021 related to payments to hospitals for direct uh, graduate medical education and indirect gradu graduate medical education costs. If you remember from the proposed rule, um, those payments for graduate medical education and the distribution of rural residency slots. Um, there's also an interim final rule with comment along with the proposed uh, Sorry, along with the rules, CMS issued an IFC, which amended current regulations to allow hospitals with a rural redesignation to reclassify through the Medicare Geographic Classification Review Board using the rural reclassified area as the geographic area in which the hospital is located. Lastly, I note that the uh, final rule this year includes the extensions of the Rural Community Hospital and Frontier Community Health Integration Project demonstrations. Um, these were both um, authorized again in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. There are also some updates uh, to SNF skilled nursing facility, inpatient rehab facility, inpatient psychiatric facility, and hospice, hospice payment rules of note. Um, there are some payment increases specific for rural facilities included in these rules as listed on the slide, and these become effective on October 1st. Moving on to the next slide, um, I just wanted to talk a bit about the calendar year 2022 Medicare proposed rules. Um, so these are out for comment right now. Uh, the first is the outpatient prospective payment system rule. I won't talk again about the RFI on rural emergency hospitals, but that's included in that rule. Um, there are also some proposed modifications to the price transparency rules. Um, specifically, I note um, a proposal to increase civil monetary penalties. So CMS proposes to set a minimum uh, CMP of $300 per day that would apply to smaller hospitals with a bed count of 30 or fewer, and then apply a penalty of $10 per bed per day for hospitals with a bed count greater than 30. And this isn't to exceed a maximum daily dollar amount of 5,500. Um, CMS is seeking comment on alternative or additional criteria that could be used to scale um, a civil monetary penalty, such as hospital revenue, uh, the nature, scope, severity, and duration of noncompliance, and the hospital's reason for noncompliance. Additionally, CMS is seeking uh, public input on a variety of issues it may consider in future, future rulemaking, um, including considerations for best practice um, online price estimator tools, improving expectations related to plain language description of shoppable services, methods to identify and hi highlight exemplar hospitals, and improving standardization of the machine readable files. There's also an opportunity to comment on some of the policies that were put in place during the public health emergency. Uh, this includes the extent to which hospitals have been billing for mental health services furnished to beneficiaries in their homes through communication technology during the COVID-19 public health emergency and whether continued demand for such care is anticipated. Also, whether there are any changes that CMS should make to account for shifting practice patterns that rely on communication technology uh, to provide mental health services to beneficiaries in their homes. And then the degree to which providers relied on the flexibility to allow the presence of the physician for the purposes of direct supervision um, for pulmonary rehabilitation, cardiac rehabilitation, and intensive cardiac rehabilitation services to include the virtual presence um, through audio, video, real-time communication technology. 
and this flexibility is scheduled to expire um, with the later of the end of the PHE or December 31st, 2021. The physician fee schedule proposed rule is also out. Um, just the first thing of note, CMS proposes that the MIPS values pathways uh, would be available gradually beginning with the 2023 performance year. Um, and again, the MIPS values pathways is a way to satisfy the MIPS requirements that moves away from the siloed reporting of measures and activities um, towards focused focus sets of measures and activities that are more meaningful to a clinician's practice, specialty, or public health priorities. There are also some policies related to RHCs and FQHCs. Um, CMS proposes to revise regulations for RHC and FQHC mental health visits to include visits furnished using interactive real-time telecommunications technology. And CMS proposes to implement um, the CAA section 132 that makes uh, RHCs and FQHCs eligible to receive payment for hospice attending physician services. There are also some proposals related to telehealth, specifically expanding telehealth and other technologies for behavioral and mental health care. CMS proposes to implement recently enacted legislation that removes certain statutory restrictions to allow patients in any geographic location and in their homes to access telehealth services for diagno diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of mental health disorders. And CMS also proposes to allow payment for certain mental and behavioral health services to patients through audio only telephone calls from their homes when certain conditions are met. Moving on to the last slide, um, I just wanted to point out a request for information on the Provider Relief Fund. This was published in the Federal Register on July 26th. Um, it seeks comment. Um, from provider relief fund recipients on the burden and utility of the information collected through the PRF reporting portal and comments are due by September 24th. And those are my updates for today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Tori and Carrie. We appreciate you being here and providing those updates. I'll turn things over to Carla um, with Arkita for an update. Thanks, Carla. I have to go grab them. So I am going to do just a quick update about the uh, quality improvement labs and the flex quality improvement um, projects. We are excited to have you guys dig into that information and to launch the quality improvement activities that will be supportive of that. So we have, um, we are really working on this effort as a team, a TA team, as I think has been mentioned a couple of different places and times. So um, FORHP and FMT and the TAS team and the Arquita team have reviewed all of the plans that you submitted after the Flex Reverse site visit, where we kind of laid out the template for the projects and then you guys submitted those by the end of, end of July. Uh, we're reaching out to a handful of you just to get a little bit more information to make sure that we kind of understand, particularly in some case situations, the data flow. But really, they looked great, and we appreciate you guys putting that information together. So following up with a few folks just to make sure we understand what you have in mind, but are excited to dig into what's next. We'll really be kicking off the launch of that with the MBQIP virtual knowledge group that is scheduled for Thursday, September 16th. This isn't a new meeting. If you have had all the um, virtual knowledge groups on your calendar for this year, this is one of them. Um, but it is going to be focused on that kick up kickoff for the quality improvement projects. We will get the uh, materials and information out in advance. If you don't already have it on your calendar, there's a registration link in your um, meeting materials and you can go ahead and register and that will get you the calendar link to have that. So I don't believe we require you to register, but that's a way to get the um, appointment link on your calendar. The next steps for the quality innovation labs, um, as Tracy mentioned, the groupings of states got sent out yesterday. There will be five different quality innovation labs. We primarily grouped them by um, topic area that folks are focusing on and will really focus in the discussions on how you're supporting improvement in your hospitals on those topics. 
We will be sending out um, information to the MBQIP lead in each state to help schedule the first. In the, so there'll be five different QILs. We're going to have each of the QILs will meet the beginning or sometime in October, depending on scheduling availability. To get that first QIL meeting, we are going to be sending out doodle polls because we really want to try to make sure that we can get everybody participating in that one. We do anticipate that we will convene the QILs about every other month, and then we'll have a follow-up survey coming out to you all to help set, set that ongoing schedule. So for the October meetings, we are going to ask you to respond to a doodle poll on behalf of the participants in your state for that, not your hospitals, whoever's kind of helping implement your quality improvement project. And then from there, um, for the rest of the year, we will figure out some standing schedules. So it may end up being for any individual QIL the second Wednesday or the fourth Thursday. I'm not sure what that will look like yet, but doodle polls for the first meeting. After that, we will have a schedule set going forward. Just a reminder that the QILs are kind of wraparound supporting opportunities to network and connect and share with other state partners. As always, individual coaching and technical assistance are available throughout, whether or not that be from the Arquita team or, or other partners as appropriate, depending on what your challenges or concerns are. So just a reminder that the QILs aren't the only opportunity for technical assistance or support, but they, we are excited about the sharing and networking that will happen in that space. We will have more information to come about shared um, space for collaboration. I think there's talk about either some sort of an extranet SharePoint type of site that will help share documents across within and across the QILs. So more details coming on that soon. So looking forward to those next steps. In the meantime, the Arquita team continues to share other um, quality improvement, quality reporting tools and resources. So if you have not checked out the uh, Quality Improvement Mentor podcasts, we encourage you to do so. I'll drop the link to those in the chat. The most recent one was about making quality improvement fun. Um, we appreciate those of you who nominated quality improvement mentors for our next round. So our first set of mentors is just wrapping up the two-year commitment that we asked for them. We have put the a little bit of a pause on the process there. Um, if you nominated someone, we sent them an application form wanting to make sure that they agree and are committed to doing so. We have recognized and heard from a couple of folks, as I'm sure you all are, that there are other priorities happening in lots of parts of the country right now, in particular, some folks working in surge capacity and emergency situations with COVID. So we want to make sure that we're getting all of the nominations from everybody who is interested. So we have put a little bit of a pause on that process, but we'll circle back around and are excited about having another group of virtual QI mentors likely to be announced later this fall. So if you know that you nominated something, somebody and are waiting to hear why, that's sort of where we're at with the process on that. We did hear from a couple of folks um, that they just couldn't even fill out the application right now, even though it's short and we just don't want to, um, we don't want to add anything on top of their plates right now. So that's where we're at with that. Um, shoot us a question, if shoot me a question if you have them or the task um, info at task is also the good resource to ask questions because the task team is great at getting them to the right partner. So, thanks. Thanks, Carla, we appreciate it. And then the last update from Megan at the Flex Monitoring Team. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Tracy. Um, just a quick update from us about what um, we've been up to lately. Um, in the past couple of months, we've released uh, two sets of our annual reports. Um, the first um, is a COF financial indicators report. Um, and so that summarizes state and national median values of 23 indicators that are on Compass, our data query tool. Um, and the second is the community impact and benefit activities of COS um, and includes other rural and urban hospitals from 2019. Um, and that one allows um, for comparing community impact and benefit profiles of COS nationally. Um, I'll drop both of those links um, into the chat as well. Um, and you can look at the state, the accompanying state specific reports for each of those as well. So we encourage you to take a look. Um, we, uh, the Flex Modern Teams project year started July 1st. So we're starting on a whole new round of projects um, this year. Um, we're working on several, one uh, focusing on the impacts of cost system affiliation during COVID. Um, we're partnering with uh, for our KEDA task on the quality improvement project and quality innovation labs this fall um, and throughout the year. 
uh, conducting an evaluation of EMS supplemental funding and looking at EMS agency licensure, licensure elements, um, looking at uh, financial and community characteristics of cause, um, participating in value-based care, um, and we're starting projects on CA engagement in multi-sector community networks, um, another project on use of translation services in CAUSE, and one on best practices for cancer care models in CAUSE. And so we've got a lot um, coming up. Um, and so uh, let us know if you have thoughts, questions, any of those, but we'll be in touch with folks as we're uh, diving into those projects. Um, and just the last quick update um, on the MBQ MBQIP data reports. Um, we are hoping to have the HCAPS reports out to you within the next two weeks. Um, so we're, we're very excited that we finally received those data. Um, those include quarters three and four data from 2020. Um, they do not um, include quarters one and two. Um, that data uh, CMS is not releasing for any hospitals, nor will they be. Um, and so those are just, um, not going to be coming out. So instead of uh, having four quarters rolled up, uh, this will be two quarters um, for this quarter and we don't have any information about what it'll look like in future. So we'll just um, keep letting you know as we find out more information. So uh, those we expect out within the next two weeks. Um, so keep an eye out for those. Um, and as always, let us know um, if you have any questions on anything um, FMT related. So thanks. Thank you, Megan. That's a, a good variety of projects for the year two. I'm excited about that. Awesome, thank you. All right, so now we're gonna transition into our topic of the day and that's leadership and mid-level management. So we have three speakers. I wanna take a, a minute or two here to introduce each of them to you so you understand where they're coming from and their expertise that they're bringing to this table. Um, so the first speaker is Terry Hill. He's the executive director for Rural Health Innovations and he's the senior advisor for Rural Health Leadership and Policy at the National Rural Health Resource Center. Terry's been for more than 30 years um, involved with rural healthcare, um, facilitated a ton of national summit meetings, um, written dozens of published articles, led uh, national demonstration projects in rural health, and helped to develop three national healthcare delivery models, critical access hospitals, the Frontier Extended Stay Clinics, and the Frontier Community Health Integration Models, and FCHIP models. Uh, not only is Terry the founder of our organization, but he's been with TAS since its inception with FRHP now 23 years ago. He's been teaching management leadership for an MBA program at the College of St. Scholastica for over a decade, and he previously lectured at the University of Minnesota Medical School. The second speaker is one that is a familiar name to you all as well if you participated in the resiliency workshop that we held with the reverse visit. So Joanne Preston is the Workforce and Organizational Development Senior Manager at the Rural Wisconsin Health Cooperative where she brings over four decades um, of healthcare leadership experience into designing and delivering leadership and employee education for rural healthcare throughout Wisconsin and the United States. She's the author of Lead the Way in Five Minutes a Day, Sparking Health High Performance in Yourself and Your Team, and runs, writes a monthly leadership blog that I highly recommend. And Bill Oxier is our third presenter today, and he's a best-selling and award-winning author, speaker, and professor, and executive coach whose expertise is in rural health leadership. Bill wears many hats serving rural health leaders around the country, including being the creator and host of Rural Health Leadership Radio. So thank you to our three presenters for being part of this. And I'll turn things over to you, Terry, um, and to Caleb to get the slides going and start our presentation. Well, thank you very much, Tracy. I'm really excited to be working with Joanne and Bill. They're, these are two people that I admire and have learned a lot from as well. Uh, this topic is one that I think is just so important. And I think COVID has really kind of brought to the forefront, you know, the, the crisis we face, not only with the, uh, the, the many patients that are, are populating our, our hospitals, but also kind of the stress and the, the kind of upset that's occurring in our hospitals with the staff. Uh, I know I have conversations with, with um, managers frequently, and they've never been as challenged. And uh, that's why I think we're really excited about the new video series that we put together. Uh, I'm going to be talking about that, a uh, little bit of background on it. But then Joanne's going to talk about a program that they've instituted for the last five years in, in Wisconsin, the Rural Wisconsin Co-op. And that's, that's, she'll give you that perspective, what she's learned, et cetera. And then as Tracy said, Bill's gonna come in uh, and he's, he's really a, a huge leadership expert. And he's also been leading the National Rural Health Association's 
uh, leadership initiatives in their, in their, their certificate program. So next slide, please. Th this is just our, our usual one, our, <laughs> our five core areas. And, and I would say leadership is extremely important in every one of these five areas. Next. So let me give you a little bit of background why the center has been interested in this for quite some time. We did, we've done a lot of work in the Mississippi Delta. And I think it was seven or eight years ago, uh, we actually sent a survey out to dozens of rural hospitals and asked them if, you know, if we were going to do any education, what would be the most important? And what we got back was mid-level manager or department manager's education was at the very top of their list. In essence, they may know, you know, the leadership very often has, has you know, might have a master's degree in hospital administration or healthcare administration. But most of the managers basically have very little of any uh, training in, in either leadership or management. And, um, you know, in, in essence, if our mid-level managers don't understand why we're moving into value and population health, they certainly can't explain it or to, to the folks that work for them, nor can they help to carry out the strategy from the hospital or the leaders themselves. So why, why should we be focusing on leadership? Uh, it's the ultimate upstream investment to ensure the downstream success. You know, we use the Baldridge, we use the Baldridge framework. Uh, there's a Baldridge award that come, comes out, which is the most coveted quality award in this country at least. And of the seven components, leadership is assigned double the weight of any other component. It's so important that leadership be aligned, that uh, we basically uh, are able to make this significant change into new payment systems and also deal with, with something as traumatic as, as COVID. Uh, it's, it's really the key. What I found after working with rural hospitals for 35 years, and you wanna bottom line it, is if you've got good leadership in a hospital, you're generally gonna have good quality, you're gonna have good, financial performance, et cetera. And you're going to have the, the resources and the understanding of the staff about how we're moving to population health. And it drives hospital strategy and it, it really increases the successful change as well. Next. So these, these are, are some of the challenges. First of all, as I mentioned before, there's just lack of leadership and management education. We, we, the center is, has become dedicated to trying to fill that void and developing materials and resources that will be easily accessible and will be seen as relevant for rural hospitals. And we count on all of you state flex program people to help us get those, those resources out. We also see a frequent turnover in leaders and uh, the center next year is gonna be focusing in on kind of the new leaders in, in our rural hospitals. And we're gonna put some resources together that will help brand new leaders. If we have a, a very successful hospital, uh, it could be that the leader is going to leave and then we're gonna have uh, all kinds of problems in, in that, with, with uh, that, that transition. Pandemic stress and unhappiness, increasing complexity of healthcare, extremely, you know, besides everything else, healthcare, is far and away the most complex of all industries, and generally a lack of board understanding of governance and the healthcare industry. For that reason, we have put some videos together already that are available on our website for board leadership education. Next. Uh, so these are some of the things that we found as we looked uh, out there in terms of resources that, that our state flex programs have or, or leadership uh, initiatives. And we found, first of all, there's, there's, there's a growing amount of virtual education. Uh, we've, as, I, as I mentioned, we produce board leadership videos, but the state of Minnesota also is, is, has put a, a virtual uh, leadership education um, program together. And so we're seeing more of that. We see leadership cohorts where, whether they're, they're nurses or, uh, you know, CFOs, et cetera, 
people coming together to actually share their experience and learn from each other. Uh, we see a lot of leadership workshops on there, both in person and virtual. Uh, Bill's gonna be talking about a leadership certificate program, uh, but that's something that the National Rural Health Association has invested. In. And as Tracy mentioned, I'm a part of a rural MBA program and there are other masters of health programs that are also really focusing on filling this void in terms of leadership, particularly in rural health. Next slide. So this is a six part educational video series uh, and we're going to now just talk about it and then I'm gonna turn things over uh, to our other speakers. Should we start with the video? Times of change call for strong leadership, yet this leadership is not always top down. Sometimes the most influential and thought provoking leaders come from the middle. Mid-level leaders are the boots on the ground, serving as a conduit between senior leaders and frontline employees. They play a critical role in translating strategy, inspiring and educating staff, communication, collaboration, and serving as role models as organizations transition into value-based payment. This program has been developed to provide mid-level leaders with some foundational knowledge and strategies that can help them lead their team and influence others around them as they navigate the uncertainty and complexity associated with the shift to value-based payment. Critical access hospitals and state flex programs continue to seek resources to support rural hospital leadership development. A variety of resources already exist to support board governance training or senior level of development, but this series is different and will improve the understanding of mid-level leaders' impactful leadership role. This series, designed for critical access hospital mid-level leaders, focuses on developing systems thinking and leadership skills as keys to thriving in the changing healthcare landscape. Participants will understand what value-based care means for you, your department, your organization, and your community. They will connect their role with the organization's mission and vision, and they will be guided to take a broad view of the healthcare system and community care coordination, and to think strategically about the local, regional, and national healthcare environment. You will learn collaborative leadership skills that can be used to lead the structural and human side of change. We'll discover effective strategies for coaching and delegation, and participants will understand the impact of their decisions on the organization's bottom line. The series consists of six 30 to 45 minute videos. Each module includes three parts, educational content with interviews from rural hospital board members, CEOs, mid-level leaders, and frontline staff who share best practices and words of wisdom. Reflection questions for mid-level leaders to think more about how module topics might apply in their facility and community, and suggested activities for mid-level leaders to put some of those best practices into action. There is also a resource guide that pulls together a collection of related resources to support learning. State Flex programs may incorporate sharing this new video series and supporting trainings in the operational and financial improvement area of their Flex program, though the impact of this program will likely touch all aspects of the hospital. In the first module, we'll explore the transition to value and population health. We'll take a brief look at the current and future state of healthcare and what it means to transition from volume to value in population health. Then we'll talk about how you and your key role as mid-level leader can help your department, your organization, and yourself navigate this transition in the midst of uncertainty when the future is unclear and the environment is continually changing. In the second module, we'd like to build on the concepts covered in the first module by exploring what it means to be a strategic thinker and systems thinker in your role as a mid-level leader and how these types of thinking can positively impact your organization's journey to value. In the third module, we're going to explore further the concept of collaborative leadership. We'll talk about what it looks like and share strategies for effectively leading with a collaborative approach. In the fourth module, we're diving straight into leading change by looking at the change process as well as the emotional side of change. We'll talk about specific things you can do as a leader of change to smooth the process and help others through the transition. In the fifth module, we're exploring a topic that can be complicated and confusing, healthcare finance. To aid mid-level leaders in understanding the impact on the organization's bottom line, we'll describe traditional healthcare finance models and move into more recent and sometimes more complex models that support the transition to value-based payment. 
Lastly, mid-level leaders will review what finances need for their role, their department, and those they lead and influence. In the sixth and final module, we're looking to the future by focusing on talent development. We'll talk about the role that talent development plays in the sustainability of the organization and in the successful transition to value. We'll help you think about ways to hire and promote employees with an eye on future needs and develop your team's skills and knowledge in meaningful ways. Thanks, let's move to, to the next slide, please. Um, and, and, and Kim Norton of our staff and Shannon Studden did the basic work on this. Um, I, I helped, but, but in essence, I think we're really proud of this. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this and then go through this pretty quickly because I think Kim laid out just a, a nice synopsis here. Uh, first of all, it is intended for rural mid-level leaders navigating the shift to value-based payment and population health. Our mid-level leaders that are currently in a, a, a crisis with, with COVID and everything else going on. Uh, we encourage the interaction between the senior leaders to use a senior leader discussion guide to reinforce the learning from the series. So uh, basically, we're, we're designing conversations to be had between the mid-level managers and the senior leaders and we have a guide that is a part of this as well. And we're hoping the state flex programs will share this uh, with hospitals. I think you're gonna find a, a, a whole lot of interest from everything that I can see. And we're, we're hoping that uh, th this sort of support is gonna impact a lot of hospitals. Next. Next slide, yeah. Uh, so again, it's it's each each module begins. Uh, we have a pre and post training evaluation template, a discussion questions. Uh, we encourage you to use the, the, the leader discussion guide. I'm going to go pretty quickly through these, Caleb. Uh, so uh, and again, these these modules are under you know we we've, we've already heard this. We're going to understand how we can help their department organizations itself to transition from volume to value. Next. Explore what it means to be a strategic and systems thinker. This is just one of those things where we really need to take the systematic approach to quality improvement, to value, et cetera. And so that element is there. Next, explore the collaborative leadership looks like and, and learn strategies for effectively leading with collaborative approach. Next. Explore the change process as well as the emotional side of change. And boy, there's a lot of emotion out there right now, I can tell you, and you folks know this as well. Learn specific things you can do as a leader of change to smooth the process and help others. Uh, a, a number of my students uh, this past spring uh, were mid-level managers. I also had CEOs, et cetera. And, and they just shared with me the, the trauma of trying to manage people when they're scared or when they're coming in with, with you know, certain emotional crises, et cetera. Uh, this is really something that we hope is gonna be helpful there. Next slide. Understand the basics of healthcare finance. We got Ralph Llewellyn to help us. Uh, we like to work with Ralph, uh, not because he's you know, the only, uh, um, financial consultant out there we use, but he, he has a real knack for kind of making things simpler uh, than maybe some of the other consultants. So he's going to be explaining, he's explaining that in these videos. Next one, learn ways to hire and promote employees to develop their team skills and knowledge in meaningful ways. Next. And this, this again, mid-level leaders in transition to value video series it includes discussion questions and activities, a discussion guide for senior leaders and mid-level managers, a, an action plan for mid-level managers, a, a series resource guide, uh, a one-page series summary, that four-minute video that you have just seen, and also a short survey to, so that the, our, these folks can share their feedback with us and we can hopefully make improvements. Next slide. Uh, 
so we these each video you can't see that really good but it just they're the discussion questions basically uh their reflection questions and suggested activities to learn to learn more about how the topics from the series apply to your to their organizations next next and and again so it's it's created both for the mid-level managers and for the senior leaders here to work together and hopefully have these series of conversations and learn from each other next slide and then we, we even created a, an action plan. Actually, Tori suggested that, and we thought it was a great idea. Let's let's actually put an action plan in here so these mid-level leaders can actually, uh, you know, budget some time and have specific objectives as, as they move forward here. So we not only have the questions, but we have a follow-up. One of the one of the suggestions is talk to your CEO about um, about value and population health and what you're doing and then this says this is going to give you a timeline when to do it and how to do it next slide uh, and and then we also have a lot of specific tools here uh, there, there's module one has as you can see three different uh, references to resources available so every one of those modules has a have resources for further study and expansion of the concepts themselves one next slide uh, so we're hoping you're going to share this resource with the hospitals um, you know i'm really proud of of this particular video series uh, and i really think it's so timely that we we just wanted to kind of share this with you it is hot off the presses it's just i think we either sent this out or it's available now uh, for you folks so please take a look at it and help us get it out next slide and again we're asking for feedback so that we can get improved we're asking for your feedback as well if you if you say hey our hospitals didn't like it uh, we'd be disappointed, but we want to hear that and any specifics that, that you've got on that. And next slide. And these are other tools that we have in our toolbox, mid-level leaders in transition to value video series, managing from the middle, middle leading through change. We've got a whole podcast series. And I mentioned the Minnesota one, Rural Minnesota Path to Value podcast series as well. So these resources, again, are all available. Uh, check out the Minnesota resource because because we think that was really well done as well. And then finally, next slide. This is the contact information. Shannon Studden uh, was staff here until very recently, and she's still working with us, but she's working at a more of a consulting basis. So I, I wanted to put her. She she is welcome. She welcomes your questions, or if you want to help, you know, hire her to help you put something together for your state. Obviously, you, you can contact her. That's her, her email. Uh, Kim Norton is, uh, works at the center. And if you, if you want to talk to somebody about how to put together a good video series, Kim is absolutely terrific. Or you can contact Tracy or I. So with that, thank you for listening to that. As, as I said, we've got this available. And I'm going to turn this over to Joanne Preston, who's going to talk about uh, her, her res leadership residency program. Joanne, you're on. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, depending on where you are. Thanks for having me. So Terry, uh, very impressive, uh, very impressive, amazing. Um, and I'm uh, honored to be on the panel with you here today and Bill as well. So the other thing that I want to say as I was listening to your updates prior to our discussion about leadership, I just want to say to all you let flex folks out there, um, I'm kind of blown away by all the stuff you know. <laughs> There's you cover a lot of ground with the work that you're doing, and it's it's amazing uh, the topics that you are expertise have expertise in. And so I was a little bit blown away by all the things that you're responsible for and. So anyway, wanted to just share that. I probably don't hear that enough. So you do, you're doing great work out there. So if you want to pop ahead to the next slide, I want to just share a, a 
a picture of what I think it looks like very often in rural healthcare. And this is very much in line with what Terry shared. The uh, Friday, you are a lab tech and Monday, you're the manager of the lab and Friday, you're the nurse uh, on the, the night shift and Monday, you're the manager of the night shift. And it's really a struggle for those middle managers out there. I think they have the hardest jobs in many cases in rural healthcare. And it's particularly hard because they're not only still doing the job that they are they were promoted from very often, they're a working manager and being in a very steep learning curve at the same time. Um, so it, it can be very challenging. So next slide, please. Um, with the Rural Wisconsin Health Cooperative where I work five years ago, we created a leadership residency program here that really looked at what are the things that those newly promoted rural healthcare leaders need right out of the gate. And we based it on our nurse residency model, which some of you may be in, uh, familiar with nurse residencies. Uh, ours is a year long program where when you are a new nurse, you come every month and you learn with other new nurses. And what was so impressive about that program over a dozen years ago when we initially had a grant to do this program was that we found that the retention of new nurses increased dramatically, like from you know the 50s and 60% after a year to in the 90s. Um, so it, it was really dramatic in helping people stay in those jobs instead of feeling overwhelmed and dealing with with a new role that they weren't familiar with. So leadership residency is the same thing, where we looked at, you know, what does that new leader need right out the gate and helping them to be successful. So it's 12 days over the course of a year. Uh, it's really targeted to those first year managers. Um, you, you just got promoted or you're new in the role, uh, but there's a caveat to that I'll talk about in a moment. The program includes one-to-one -one coaching calls outside of the classroom so they can speak with the instructors who are all experienced rural healthcare leaders from uh, nursing, uh, someone who started as a, an LPN and has 40 years of nursing experience, the senior level. Uh, myself, I started in rural healthcare and was promoted in the first three months 40 years ago. And so that, that move up through the, the ranks, all of our instructors lived that model. And so it's really targeted towards that. And so we can provide that one-to-one -one coaching. We're all about action-oriented learning where we do experiential activities, we do small groups, we do a project. The students are all uh, participating in a project throughout the course of their year that they report on at the end. We just completed this year and the projects are impressive. The, the money that they're able to save their organizations, the efficiencies they're able to gain by using the tools that we teach them is just amazing. So uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the caveat I was talking about a moment ago. Um, we look for the first year leaders, those just promoted, but this testimonial from Misty, one of our former class uh, participants. She was three years into her role as a manager. And very often it's, um, you know, people that have great potential for leadership, they want to move into leadership, they're good at their jobs, at whatever those technical roles are. And then they move into management and struggle because it's like, you should know what to do, right? But there's a lot to it. So Misty, I just wanted to share this testimonial that even three years into her role, she was struggling, she was drowning, and coming to this residency just helped her to really understand the things that she needed to know how to do. So you can go forward to the next slide, please. So the sessions are created to start, if you wanna think about from the inside out. So if you're thinking about yourself as a participant, if you're in this role, the first time you come, we're gonna focus on you. What's your personality? Um, uh, what's, what makes you tick? I'm gonna go through each of these, but a little bit, but basically start with yourself. Secondly, we move into all those things about communication. How do I communicate who I am? The third piece is, you know, I can't do this alone, which very often a middle manager will try to do. They hide behind some of their old role, partly because they were a working manager. Certainly this past year they have been. We had a lot more absences uh, with COVID than we've ever had because people don't wanna miss this program, but you have to go be a floor nurse. You have to go work in the pharmacy. Um, but how do you get others to do stuff? That's what the I can't walk, can't do this alone is about. Walking your talk is about living your values, 
how do you impact the bigger picture? Just like with Terry's uh, discussion with their programs, it's about systems thinking and aligning what does mission, vision, and values look like when you're walking your talk. And the last couple of sessions, how do I follow the rules and how do I even know what they are? Uh, I was noticing as the, the flex coordinators were talking, all the acronyms that you, you use. If any of you are new, um, you know, there's a learning curve, I'm sure, to all of that because it's, there's a lot to learn in this new role. Next slide, please. So again, to drill down a little bit on each of the six sessions, which we have done here, what we, what we do in Wisconsin is they come for two days every other month. And, uh, and they've been doing it in person, though this year we were completely virtual all year until the very last session. And I'll get to some of the benefits of that in a moment. But um, the first session, we talk about things like uh, servant leadership about uh, personality and diversity and understanding uh, you know, how you handle the stress of the role because it's gonna be off the charts in many cases for people as they're trying to navigate all this learning. Uh, how do you manage your time and your priorities? Uh, that role of working manager, um, just as an example, this is one of the places where it can feel really comfortable to say, yeah, I'll help out on the floor because I know how to do that. And I'm competent there and I'm comfortable there. The downside of that is that for a new manager, you end up spending too much time there and not delegating. And so we wanna help that manager step out of that and ask for help and learn how to delegate to others and communicate that well so that they can do the roles of managing and leading. Um, and then really understanding your personal values and aligning those with organizational values. What do organizational values mean and what do they look like and where do yours match up with that? You can go ahead to the next slide. The second topic that we are focusing in on are communication. It's all about communication. So uh, being assertive, dealing with conflict, addressing performance and performance reviews and negotiating, giving feedback is really tough, especially for that peer to boss role. Um, you, you, know, you, you work alongside these folks, they're your friends, you went to their baby showers and now you're the manager and you have to talk to them about uh, being tardy for work or not turning in quality work and it's difficult we know these folks, they're our, they're our friends. And so we talk a lot about that, that movement from peer to boss and doing those coaching conversations. Uh, we do a lot of work with managing projects. So you're not just the individual contributor, but you are the one that has to make that project happen. So here we start to talk with folks about their class project and we don't ask them to do something in addition to their work but we ask them to use the tools that we share in the PDSA and all of the just basic tools of, of managing uh, process improvements to the work that they're doing. Um, and then we talk about debriefing, you know, certainly debriefing uh, critical incidents and uh, the debriefing of onboarding uh, participants and that sort of thing. Okay, next slide. So this is also about not being able to do things alone. It's about uh, navigating change. Terry talked about that whole change theory and how important that is. And we've all resisted a change before. Everybody on this call uh, has at a time when a change came upon your organization and you felt resistance to it. So we just talk about that. What's that about? And how can you deal with your own change resistance? And what is it really? And how do you understand change from a theoretical point of view, but the straight on the floor point of view when you're explaining it and talking to people about it? Um, working with teams, setting SMART goals, getting uh, having better meetings, uh, you know, really thinking about uh, goal setting, um, tying all of these things to, if you wanna move to the next slide, um, being able to walk your talk. So when it boils down to it, the tie to patient care, uh, I, I should have said this at the beginning, I mean, and really in truth, when it comes to quality and safety for patients, leadership's way of dealing with employees and addressing situations, that drives the culture. And the culture creates safety or it doesn't. Um, leaders drive the ability to have integrity or not. They drive the way we communicate or not. Leaders drive things like lateral violence, which in healthcare is, 
you know, eating your young. So we, we talk about all of those things and how that directly impacts patient care, even for those that are not in direct patient care. So, um, you know, if we don't speak up about something that we've seen that's a concern, or we don't feel like it's safe to address uh, certain topics, then safety suffers. We talk about the, the culture, creating culture and how it's, hard to talk about, but if I ask you to think about, you know, your own workplace culture, what are the, the, how would you describe it? What does it feel like to walk in to your organization? And leaders drive that by their behaviors, by walking their talk and, and really attending to excellence, being on stage all the time, having a just culture, having a safe culture and how we orient new people. I'll have you go ahead and go to the next slide. So, You'll notice some parallels, I know, with, with Terry's program, because these are science-based leadership paths. We have to bring our best self to our work, but we also have to understand systems. Everything we do impacts others. So helping leaders to understand that and to not operate in silos so that they're working across the system. When we bring in a CEO panel, one of the best topics of the year, they love it. Um, and CEOs talk about their, their journey to their leadership role. They talk about how they create systems that work, that, that build teams, that get everybody going to, um, you know, all the ships, sh ships sailing to the same shore and that sort of thing. We have even had some people who have said, you know, I never thought I'd want to be a CEO, but after hearing that, I, I think I might want to do that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, finance for the non-finance manager, things that you're expected to know if you've never filled out uh, an FTE sheet. So uh, these, are, these are some things that we go through. All right, let's go into the, the next one. So we, we also talk about community health needs assessment, um, moving to, again, all the regulatory and the rules piece. So how do I follow the rules? Quality, safety, lean. Uh, we do a human resources overview, FMLA, understanding you know, what your roles and responsibilities are with that and the ADA, disciplinary actions, population health. I mean, and this is a big piece of what you were talking about before we started is you know, how do you help people understand the bigger picture in healthcare? And they leave with a five-year plan. Next slide, please. So what's new for 2022 is the national leadership residency. We learned from having to do Zoom for a year that it worked really well. The participants loved it. They could participate from their home. Uh, we had, as I said, a few more absences because of COVID, but what was also good is that if someone was exposed or not feeling well, they could still participate remotely. And we really made this work for people. We built a great sense of team. And um, we, we really are looking at how we can bring that nationally. So what's happening in 2022, starting January, is we are offering this program to a national audience, open to healthcare leaders, primarily again in their first year of leadership role. And uh, the, if you can go to the next slide, I'll give you a couple of resources for how to access that information. So a couple of things, you can contact me directly. My, my contact info is here. There's a link to the registration, which gives you a number of things. It gives you uh, the, all the details of the program, all the curriculum details, all the dates. It's going to be once a month for a half day uh, through 2022. And um, it gives you a little video of me and uh, actually one of my other colleagues who are talking about the program and, and a little bit more detail about it. There's a link to a CEO interview. We just did this with one of our CEOs who has sent participants every year for five years and uh, really just can't say enough about the return on investment. Yes, it's, it's got a cost to it, but there's a return because we're always needing to invest in these leaders if we wanna keep them. Um, there's a couple other resources I want to share with you. Uh, Tracy mentioned them already, but I wanted you to know that the Lead the Way in Five Minutes a Day, uh, Sparking High Performance in Yourself and Your Team, that's a book that I just wrote. And it's, I, I'm really proud of it. And I think that it's a great resource, especially for new leaders. It's quick, easy tips that you can use and incorporate in your day as you're learning leadership. And then subscribe to the monthly leadership blog. It's a monthly free uh, resource for folks to read. It's, lent, it's meant to read in five minutes. In fact, that's where the book came from, is 10 years of writing those newsletters. 
And uh, if you want to sign up or encourage people to sign up, it's it's something that they'll get in their inbox monthly that just provides some quick tips and resources. So I feel like I talked really fast. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this program with you. I welcome your, your questions and inquiries. Uh, please reach out to me if you have any questions. Joanne, thank you so much. Uh, just, that's, it's an extraordinary book, so let me put in a plug for, for it as well, as well as this program. And you know, the Rural Wisconsin Hospital Co-op co has been a key partner with the state office uh, of rural health in Wisconsin. So you know, if, if, you're, if you're wondering, ask, ask Catherine Miller about uh, uh, kind of the resources that are available as well. So thank you. Let me turn things over to Bill, uh, and he's going to talk about what is leadership and also tell us a bit about the programs that the National Rural Health Association have begun. Can't hear you, Bill. Can't hear you, Bill. Yes, so the new hit song for 2021 is Unmute Yourself. All right. Uh, Caleb, I'm just going to say click when it's time to switch slides. That'll save me words. Um, so you're talking to three like-minded individuals with Terry, Joe, and myself today. It's no coincidence that Terry Hill's been a guest on my podcast. And uh, uh, Joe, uh, I just enter, we just had her interview. It hasn't been published yet where she's talking about her book that she just alluded, alluded to. So you, the beautiful thing about a podcast, you can go back to listen to Terry's interview, which was a couple of years ago and uh, tune in to listen to Joe's interview uh, coming up. But wait a minute. We're all talking about leadership. What the heck are we talking about? You know, when I talk about something, I like to make sure we're all on the same page. And the one thing I've learned about leadership is everybody has a different definition. In fact, I had a guy call me uh, who was a podcast listener and he uh, asked me, he said, Bill, can you help me get some leadership training? And I said, well, I'm sure I can put you in touch with the right people if I can't help you myself. What is it you want to know about or learn about? And he says, well, I don't understand Medicaid. I said, okay, that's a great skill set to have, but you can know everything in the world that anyone could possibly know about Medicaid and still be a crappy leader. Uh, leadership is a different category. So let's talk about what leadership is. Click. And to talk about this, I have to have props. So I have three things that are gonna help me, an apple, a mole, and some seals. Click. Now you notice I spell apple a little differently, A-P-L-E. And the AP stands for authority and power, and LE equals leadership effectiveness. And in all the conversations I've had with rural health leaders, there is quite often, especially when someone has just been promoted to a management position, they get a little confused about leadership is, what leadership is. Management and leadership definitely are two separate things. They have a lot of things in common, but the way I like to think of it very simply is that if you're a manager, you have a playbook. You have the hospital's policies and procedures, and it's your job to implement those. Whereas leadership, you might be creating your own, blazing your own trail and creating your own path. There's not necessarily a pay, playbook that goes along with that. You need to be both a manager and a leader. They're not mutually exclusive. One's not better than the other and all that. But what I found is that a lot of times when someone gets promoted to be a manager, they think, all right. I've got authority and power. People will listen to what I say now. Click. Well, if that were true, the higher your authority and power you have means the more you would have greater leadership effectiveness. And there would be this direct correlation. So you'd have this beautiful relationship, this beautiful linear relationship uh, equating authority and power to leadership effectiveness. But has anyone ever worked for someone who had a very high level of authority and power, but they weren't an effective leader. Or conversely, have you ever worked for someone who <laughs> had no authority and power, but they were a very effective leader? Click. So this 
is a myth that authority and power equals leadership effectiveness. And that's something important for uh, mid-level managers, especially people that get promoted to understand. Click. Click. All right, my friend, the mole. Mole stands for motivating others and leadership effectiveness. Click. So with motivating others, I would argue that there is a direct correlation between motivating others and leadership effectiveness. Click. If you can motivate, if you are excellent at motivating others, odds are you're going to be a very effective leader. Click. If you're an average at motivating others, you're probably going to be an average leader. Click. And if you're lousy at motivating others, you're going to be a lousy uh, leader with a la low leadership effectiveness scores. Click. Now, my friend, the SEALs. There's a great video on YouTube uh, with Simon Sinek, when, with him talking about this very concept about uh, Navy SEALs and leadership and what's more important, performance or trust. So with Navy SEALs, the conversation is all about life and death, literally. Life and death on the battlefield. These are special forces that go into very <laughs> dangerous situations and they have to ha have faith in their leader because it could cost them their life. So click. So what they talked about were performance and trust. Performance means how well you do on the battlefield when the bullets are flying. Trust means how much do you trust this person with your spouse and your money? And so you would think, click, that performance, that's okay, Caleb, click, click. You would think that if someone was a low performer on the battlefield, you probably wouldn't want to follow them in the battle. That, and that's true. And you would think that if someone was a high performer on the battlefield, that's the person you want to follow. But what the Navy SEAL said, it's more important to trust that person. In fact, they, will, they would prefer a leader who might be off the charts performance-wise, but if they trust them, the trust part is more important. In other words, they're willing to risk their life even though they know somebody might not be a 10 on the performance chart if they have a high level of trust. Click. So what I like to position it as is that leadership is all about creating an environment of motivation and trust. If you can motivate others and create an environment where they uh, are trusting where people aren't afraid to speak up, that's where you're gonna be an effective leader. And these, based on my experience working with rural health leaders around the country, is for every leader, whether they're a mid-level manager or in the C-suite, these are important elements to understand for leadership effectiveness. Click. Now, before I get into this slide, this just means I wear a lot of hats, just like most rural health leaders. But one of the things that I do when I work with leaders, I always push them because they usually don't do it unless I do push them, is to create their own personal definition of leadership. It's so important because when you have that personal definition of leadership and you've written it down, that's your invisible compass, compass when you're wandering off that beaten path, because as leaders, we do have to blaze our own trails. And that's one of the tools that I use in in every aspect of leadership development work that I do. But as I said, I try to emulate every rural health leader I know by wearing a lot of different hats, and therefore I'm involved in a lot of leadership development programs. Click. As Terry alluded to, I'm the program director for the NRHA certification programs. Terry's one of our subject matter experts, actually, on, public, on population health. Uh, we search out the country's leading subject matter experts for all the modules. It's a modular-based program, every one of these. We have the NRHA Rural Hospital CEO Certification Program, the Rural Hospital CNO Certification Program, and the Rural Hospital CFO Certification Program. And we have other certification programs that are, are work in progress as we speak. Uh, the CEO Certification Program, we're just finishing up 
our uh, third cohort. We will be starting another cohort this fall, same for the, the CNO certification program. We started, just launched that program earlier this year. We're finishing up our cohort there, getting ready to launch another fall program. And uh, we just launched our fir very first CFO certification program. Uh, we are lining up uh, researchers too, because we want to track the long term impact that these programs have both economically and uh, also measuring other variables to see what impact that they are having. But uh, so far, the feedback from the participants themselves have been incredible. When the COVID pandemic hit a rip back early last year, I have to admit selfishly, I thought, oh my God, that's going to destroy our certification programs. But if, that very same day, I received an email, a very cryptic email. You could tell it was written quickly saying, I could not have picked a better time to be in this program because they were collaborating with each other on what are you doing? Here's what we're doing. You know, it was all about leadership, collaboration, figuring out what do we need to do, being motivating and trusting to figure all that out. Uh, so uh, we're very excited about these programs. They seem to be making a huge difference. Click. Uh, also, one of the things that I've been doing of late is uh, Leadership Academy partnerships. A couple of recent examples, the Rural Health Association of Tennessee Leadership Academy. We just finished that up. And right now we've launched the Arkansas 2021 Rural Health Leadership Summer Academy. Uh, for any of you who might know uh, Kenata Mumford, in the state office there, uh, coordinated that with her. And also back to the CEO uh, certification programs, uh, the state of Arkansas and the state of Oklahoma have supported uh, some of the CEOs within their states uh, with tuition, uh, help with their tuition to participate in these programs and these leadership academy uh, partnerships are are similar. Also, I've done some uh, work with Rachel Sprinkle down and her team down in Mississippi with some customized leadership training. Click. And for me, my own company, uh, you know, I do a lot of work uh, with rural hospitals, cultural transformation initiatives, employment engagement initiatives, uh, strategic planning, mastermind groups. So, like I said, I wear a lot of different hats, but they all have an L on the tag inside, and that doesn't stand for large, it stands for leadership. And so click. Uh, last but not least, I even have a free resource for you, the Rural Health Leadership Radio Podcast. I've been blessed to uh, be on the air, so to speak, for five years. I've even been blessed with working with uh, Terry and Sally and their team on putting uh, a couple of podcasts together there, but Rural Health Leadership Radio is absolutely free. It's all about uh, sharing best practices, talking about what's working, what's not working, lessons learned and all that sort of thing. And that only costs you your time. All you have to do is uh, dial in on whatever your favorite podcast app might be. All right, uh, click. So what's your definition of leadership? I challenge each of you tonight before you go to bed to write something down. What is your definition of leadership? I just interviewed someone yesterday for my podcast and they defined leadership as uh, the ability to carry oneself with, uh, uh, carry oneself with confidence and dignity. I think I got that right. And so kind of an interesting definition, but confidence and dignity, I thought were kind of two key interesting words. They went on to elaborate on that. So everybody has a little bit different spin. There's some common themes, but think about it. what is your definition of leadership? Click. That's me, that's my name, that's my email address, that's my phone number. If you have anything, uh, any questions, I uh, welcome you to reach out to me. Uh, through my podcast, I've got to meet, that's one of the big blessings. I've got to meet so many incredible people who are interested in rural health leadership that uh, I may not have the expertise, but odds are I probably know somebody that can help you with whatever you're working on as it pertains to leadership. Terry, thanks for inviting me to be here. Joe, it's great to be on the same uh, platform as, as you and Terry. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And um, I'm just wondering, do, do, do you have questions? One of the things, one of the questions that I have for, for our audience is, um, I, I see, um, you know, 
our flex coordinators, our flex people as leaders. I mean, they whether they want to acknowledge or not, they are leading uh, the flex programs, uh, you know, in partnership with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, et cetera. So I'm just wondering, do, do, do you folks, you know, think of yourself as, as leaders? Uh, with, we're hoping this, that this, this video series is going to be really helpful for you folks as well. So, um, you know, we, we can all learn more about this, but I'm just wondering, are there any questions? Uh, you can put it into the chat if, if you'd like, um, or, or just uh, un unmute yourself and, and speak up and ask. Well, since I've got a, a few minutes, and if you're thinking of what, a question, I'll, I'll just run it out for, for Joe and Bill. Uh, you guys have been working here for, you know, in the field, just like I have for decades. Uh, what are the, you know, if when you look at what you've learned over the years, if you're going to summarize it in a, you know, in one or two points, uh, what would that be? What would what would be the most important thing you might have learned working uh, with rural hospitals? Joe, I'll, I'll start with you. I just I kind of chuckled because I thought maybe I can summarize everything I know in one or two points. <laughs> That's okay. kind of scary. Um, so the, sometimes the more I the older I get, the less I know. It feels like. Um, but I I do want to say that related to your question about you know, who is a leader. And some of those folks on the call were in the program that I did on resilience for your reverse site visit. And I think about whether it's leading other people or leading ourselves, it starts with leading ourselves, how we choose to show up every day. And um, the people on the call are no different than me. You, you have hard days, you, you're, we're all dealing with a pandemic, we're all being pulled lots of different directions. As I said, you got a lot on your plate. How do you, how do you manage all of that? And it's, um, it, it's all day, every day, making that choice of how I want to show up. One of the things that a lot of uh, hospitals do is they hold um, high, middle, and low performance conversations with employees. So you've got your top 10 to 20 percent that are really performing at an excellent level. You've got your middle performers who are your solid performers. They show up every day. They do their jobs. And then you've got your low performers that, you know, they've been working there 20 years and they've just kind of gotten by and they just keep getting by with just doing the bare minimum. And I was thinking to myself, I think we all have high, middle and low performing as part of each and every day. And our challenge is to how do I keep moving myself into that high performance of my own leadership, my own integrity, my own walking my talk. And then I'm going to turn around and look and there will be people following me if I'm doing that. So it's, it's, it's about starting with yourself. That's just what comes to my mind with your question, Terry. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's something that is ongoing. We're just, we're constantly learning. We've spent decades in this and it just, to me, we've just kind of scratched the surface of, 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 uh, of how to be more effective. And uh, so, yeah, thank you. Bill, in about uh, a minute or two, you, you wanna give your, uh, answer? Yeah, I think it's uh, the status quo. The status quo is the big enemy. You know, we, why do we do it this way? Because we've always done it this way. Uh, and why do we need to change? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, uh, the status quo is our biggest enemy because things are changing whether we are or not. And if we don't change, uh, we're going to get left behind. And that includes leadership, uh, the way we lead, how we lead, uh, how we define leadership, because that's changed dramatically in my own lifetime. Uh, what was acceptable when I was a young uh, puppy in my 20s and what's acceptable as leadership today, two different, two different uh, worlds. And uh, so we got to make sure that we're inviting uh, young leaders to the table because I of course, anytime you make generalizations, you can shoot holes in them, right? I'm a baby boomer. Most rural hospital CEOs are like in my age group. And most hospital boards are in my age group, making all the decisions on who's going to be the leaders of the future. 
We need to make sure young people are included in those conversations. Uh, and we got to fight the status quo at the same time. Yeah, this one young leader once after a couple of glasses of wine came up to me and said, you old guys are going to die. And then where are we going to be when we're all hell? So uh, I, I totally understand what you're saying. OK, thank you so much, guys. I'm going to turn things back over to Tracy and then we're going to have a poll, I think, as well. Tracy. Thank you. Yeah, and if you um, didn't have an opportunity to ask any questions that you might have today, feel free to email task at rurlcenter.org. You can drop them in the chat here real quick, and we want to make sure that we respond to those that, that might be still outstanding. Um, so we have a couple polling questions for you as you close out. So Caleb, if you could pop those out on the screen, that'd be great. Um, so there are um, similar questions to before, just kind of gauging your level of knowledge about the role of mid-level managers and their role and value-based payment models, um, your knowledge about leadership initiatives that could be implemented in your state, um, whether or not you learned something today and in your satisfaction with the webinar today. So take a minute to answer those for us. And while you do that, I will tell you a little bit about what's on your screen too about upcoming task events as there's quite a few here in the next month. So at the end of the month on the 31st, there's an HIT coalition call. Again, if you're interested, let us know. We'd love to have you join in on that. Um, there it will be a presentation from F4HP and Tori Leach on September 2nd about wrapping up the fiscal year of 2020, so this current year, um, and PIMS reporting and end year reporting. So look for that on September 2nd. As I mentioned at the beginning of the call today, we will have a webinar on September 9th to launch the new Critical Access Hospital Telehealth Guide. As Arkita mentioned, and I think you, it's probably on most or all of your radars, there's an MBQIP virtual knowledge group in the kickoff of the QI project on September 16th. And that recording then of that event, because it is a virtual knowledge group, will be placed into the Flex forum and not publicly on the website. And then our last or sixth um, of the telehealth webinar series for this current program year will be on September 22nd about rural telebehavioral health. That's part two of that series on telebehavioral health, but part six of the six uh, webinars. So look for all of those events to be forthcoming to you and notices and things like that. Um, so thank you to all of our presenters today, all of uh, the partners that provided update, and a special uh, thank you to Caleb Lizinski for stepping in to help coordinate the event today, too. We appreciate you as well. So take care, everybody. Stay safe and well, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>